I hope not the last, but one of the very few composers I've ever met who had a direct connection with the long tradition of Western art music. His family was a family of musicians, of singers and cellists and double bassists. And of course, his brother, Kenneth, is still a well-known double bassist. Only himself played cello and uh, the piano somewhat. Um, and uh, he grew up with orchestras. And he grew up with, with the Western classical concert repertoire from the age of zero. Um, Barry Tuckle says that at the age of one, he could just point to a record and say, just by the look of the grooves, what, what the music was. I think it might have been, with due respect to the late Barry Tuckle, who was an amazing musician, but I think it might have been a little bit later than that, to be perfectly frank. Um, but still, uh, one takes the point. Um, and there is the famous story, which Ollie used to tell himself, of uh, him going to Malcolm Sargent in a rehearsal with the London Symphony Orchestra, where his dad was, of course, the principal double bass, and, 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 and going up to Malcolm Sargent and saying, hang on, you've got to turn the record over here in the middle of the rehearsal, um, much to everyone's amusement. Um, then, too, his dad was um, a regular player with Benjamin Britten's English Opera Group. He's on the recording, uh, first recording of Benjamin Britten's opera, the, the first of the church parables, Curly River, which has a very important double bass part. So you can hear uh, Stuart Nusson, he was called, but he was actually, they were both called Stuart Oliver, I believe. Um, Ollie's real name was actually also Stuart. Um, and uh, Stuart Nusson's double bass playing is very audible uh, in the Curly River recordings, there's only seven players. And Ollie was at all the first rehearsals for that, including an over the weekend or virtually overnight rewrite of the climax of the work, which wasn't working. And Britain, being a very practical man, realised and said, it's all right, I'll go in and redo that. And, and redid it completely, and the very poignant uh, climactic moment with the appearance of the, the ghost of the, the murdered boy. Uh, that was all done over a night, virtually over a weekend. Um, and I think uh, Ollie was very struck by Britain's dexterity in overnight thinking up this marvellous moment, uh, uh, which really makes the whole opera just like that. And I think that made an enormous impression on him, the professionalism that that betokened, and the fact that Britain was always working with people, people he knew, people he cared about, building up a community of musicians around him. And of course, you know about that, Nancy, because you were one of Ollie's community. And that, that, was, that was how we met. Um, so he, Ollie did, in many ways, was very influenced by Britain, also very influenced by the polar opposite of Britain, a, a composer he very much admired, meaning Pierre Boulez. You could speak of Ollie as a kind of extraordinary fusion of Boulez, Britain, and a sort of Russian uh, fantastical music of the late 19th century and, and Stravinsky, whom of course he met um, when, when he was young. Uh, that, that's who I'd say he was, but it's not as a composer. But of course it's not adequate to say that because he was also a, an amazing conductor. The pieces are so poignant because they evoke within a flick of a semi-quaver, within an instant, a whole range of culture, not just musical culture, the great love he had, uh, had of Western visual arts comes in too. His love, for example, of fairy painting, Victorian fairy painting. And so when you deal with Flourish with Fireworks, you're not merely dealing with something which already evokes um, Michael Tilson Thomas, his beloved conductor of the LSO at that time, the Chief Conductor, the LSO itself, which was after all his orchestra as a kid, his, his dad's orchestra, but also evokes this extraordinary painting by Richard Dad which is one of the most dense and detailed multi-layered Victorian fairy paintings, uh, which is a small painting, but it, it's, it's like looking at a fractal. As Ollie realised, and so he made the piece seemingly teeming with it, but it's also referring, as the, tires, uh, as the title suggests, it's referring to Stravinsky's little orchestral piece, Fireworks, um, which is alluded to, but it's only in the background somewhere. It's alluded to near the opening, and, and just near the ending. Well, he used to joke that the ending of his piece was a, a few seconds after the ending of the Stravinsky, so you can see a little uh, Stravinsky-type ending and then Ollie's ending a few bar and a half later or something. So if you take just a piece like that, 
um, which also evokes in its middle section the British canon, uh, Summer is Coming In. That, I mean, why doesn't the piece have to be longer? There's already almost too much to take in. There, there, there's an extraordinary plethora of not merely sound and gesture, but, but culture swimming around in those, those four minutes, was it, four and a half minutes? And that, that feels, therefore, like a large-scale piece. He used to compare his smaller pieces to the kind of micro-detail you get in a kind of very exquisitely called Fabergé egg or something like that. Um, and so they don't necessarily... So um, it's rather like what Henry Moore said, that size is in the eye of the beholder when it comes to an object. And uh, I think that's true in time with, with Ollie's music. Um, but then, too, in some of his later pieces, uh, which was quite a surprise, he began to find a more expansive and relaxed manner. Uh, the horn concerto is the first of those. The violin concerto is clearly an example of that. Um, and uh, also the songs, the Requiem songs for Sue. Um, it's interesting because the piece he wrote right before the horn concerto was the two organa, which, but the second of which is probably the densest packed piece he ever wrote. And whenever I hear that, I always feel as though I've been in the world for, oh, I don't know, 25 minutes or something, and it's, what, three? Um, so it's, it's a question also of, of how sustaining invention. He hated waste. He, uh, he loathed waste. He was always pruning. That's also a thing, I think, from Britain, as well as from his first teacher, Ollie's first teacher, John Lambert, whom, with whom I was also honoured to study with. Now, Lambert, who taught also Mark Turnage, Simon Bainbridge, uh, Jonathan Lloyd, um, a whole sheaf of, of British composers, a large number, went, also American composers, uh, went to study with. But Lambert was a Boulanger student, and economy was very much one of the watchwords. In fact, I know he told me that, that John's sort of conscience about not wasting time in music was, was something he, he learned from his lessons with him, yes. He sketched at times very, very elaborately. The music gives the impression, almost always, of flowing very spontaneously, but that wasn't so at all. Um, uh, the, the sketches, for example, which I, I know very well, for Trumpets, which is a very short and intense song for a soprano and three clarinets, which he wrote for the late great soprano Jane Manning and her group The Matrix, so well, it was Alan Hacker's group, um, and that had hundreds of pages of sketches. There were row charts, uh, ways of treating harmony, the melody, the rhythm of the trial German text, uh, at every conceivable angle, although it was written pretty quickly, but you wouldn't know that from the sketches because there's a mountain of, I mean, I don't know where he found the time. I mean, it, it was only wrote in about, I think, six weeks at most. I think less, about a month. I mean, you'd think it would take a year. Um, the mind obviously worked very fast when he was on the ball. Very, very fast. And I think he found composing exhausting, actually. And I think that was one of the reasons why in later years he, he sometimes did it less, because the just the sheer mental effort of it was very, very tiring to him, because he really didn't see any point in doing it other than at full tilt. And he really did, he wouldn't tolerate that at all. Um, not much from other people, and certainly not from himself, ever. Uh, so if he was going to do it, he wanted the piece to be just right. Um, I mean, every composer wants that, but he really had a very high standard for that. And um, and I think every time he finished the piece, he was, he was happy, but he was shattered. Well, I think most composers are composing all the time in their head anyway. Mm. Um, and I remember when I was a boy, first went to see him, uh, and he was, I must say, marvellously kind and treated me like a colleague. I mean, I was 13, it was crazy. Uh, he was 29, but already very, very experienced composer indeed. Uh, but, I mean, he, he treated me in, in, um, totally without any condescension at, at all. At all. Um, I was writing music mainly in my head, or trying to, and then trying to just write that down. And, of course, as the music got more and more intricate, that was less and less... Uh, easy to do um, <clears throat> and he was quite clear-headed about the role the head can play in a composing process and the way the paper can help. Now I still have at home something he did for me which was that 
I said, look, I've got this idea of a piece based on visions of the afterlife. I mean, it's kind of pretentious for a 15-year-old, isn't it? And um, I described in quite precise detail what I wanted the piece to do and how long for each bit would last and what kind of register and instrumentation and so on. And Ollie took this down and made a little graph of it. And many of his pieces, there were initial graphs like that where he would imagine the music in real time and make these little squiggles and, and a template of time for roughly how long it's in it. And, um, and that was, as it were, the first sketch for that piece. In fact, I, I didn't get very far in the full score. I'm sorry, Ollie. But, uh, but he, um, he, he, that was one way to control the time, to, to get an instinctive, so that he knew that. And he said, what he said was that you'll be able to do some things in your head, but you'll, head, but you'll need the paper to help you focus that and make it more precise because sometimes what you hear in your head can be absolutely right but often it can be quite general or, or even just regurgitated cliches and of course cliches have their part in any music but you want to make sure you're using them constructively and, and positively not just being submitted to that and so uh, he, I think some pieces were written more in his head than, than others I had the impression that the piece that was written most in his head I may be quite wrong was probably the violin concerto slow movement, mm -hmm. which I know was written extremely quickly, um, which is a very heartfelt, but quite unlike anything else in his output, and which is based, not based, it's a homage partly to the one of his favorite pieces of Buzzoni, and he's a big fan of for Richard Buzzoni's music, um, the Berceuse Elegiac. It is another Berceuse Elegiac. He was obsessed with lullabies anyway, it was Sonia's lullaby, and there are many lullabies in other pieces of, of his. So I think sometimes it was, but the, the, the point was to get it to a point where it could be put down on paper absolutely right very quickly. Now that could take an enormous amount of time, and yes, actually a lot of pre-sketching, and then suddenly he could just do it. I think also there was another factor which is de-inhibiting himself. There were, I think, a lot of inhibitions, psychological, musical, all kinds of inhibitions. There probably are many composers, but you can certainly sense it with him, and I could. Um, and it was a question of kind of getting it to the point where he didn't feel many people were looking over his shoulder saying, well, when's it ready? When's it going to go? Come on, when are you going to get on with it? When's it going to go? Or, for that matter, the shadow of his father about whom he had complicated feelings, his great love, but also I think his father was sometimes a bit intimidating from what he told me. Um, to feel that, that he didn't have his, you know, uh, uh, shadow over his shoulder saying, well, shouldn't you be conducting or something? Because he always used to say that his father really had wanted him to be a conductor much, much more than a composer. And that one of the reasons he did compose in discussion was what his father did not want him to do. gave him a private space in music because his father was not a composer. Mm. It is always hard when a composer dies suddenly and despite his, his uncertain health, Ollie's death locally was, was a sudden event, um, to really see where they might have been going. I think of uh, uh, another composer I was on that um, died very suddenly, whose sudden death, although they were not, uh, I don't think Ollie ever met him, but Ollie was very st struck by his sudden death, rather upset actually, uh, Gerard Grise, whom you did know, I believe, mm -hmm. Um, also, and the last pieces of Gerard show a quite new direction developing in his style, and um, that is clearly to me true of the last piece Ollie was writing, O Hototoki Su, which has, I, I think one can say, first of all, it's a sound world that I don't find in any of his other music. Um, it's quite unearthly, quite uncanny. Um, this is a composer also finding again some roots in a composer who just died whom he admired and who's quoted in the work uh, Pierre Boulez and it could be said that it's it's a little bit of a contrast quite a sharp one actually to his immediately preceding works uh, there's no references to tonality in that work it's a very elusive piece in terms of any sense of key or any sense of home base, it's floating, which was an aspect of Japanese music and art that he also admired very much. And of course, he was a, not a, I mean, he was, he was a real connoisseur 
uh, of both Japanese traditional music, particularly gagaku, and also Japanese art, very, very much so, especially Hiroshige, who's a great beloved artist of, of Oli. So I feel with, with that work that one's got a quite new aspect to Oli's style. It's recognisably him all the time, but it's floating free of, of many different rhythmic concerns and the spatial element and the flute being it and you know echoing in the piano all kinds of the way that things resound and bounce off each other in the most surprising way um and when i first heard it i was quite startled and, and delighted i must say when i last heard it was at the wonderful memorial event in the royal academy of music which you were playing in of course uh, conducted by ryan wigglesworth his his, his close colleague and there it seemed to me that it, it was almost like music from the other... I mean, it sort of sounds sound sentimental about this, but it was like music from the other side, in a way. Something quite unearthly and, and, and uh, unlike anything else he ever wrote. So one pines to think of what, what else he might have found from wherever that is, uh, because he was finding new things. Yes, definitely. It's very fresh. Um, no, I have no idea, but I think that knowing Ollie's output, that wherever one thought it would go would be not where it went. <laughs> he was a great one for contradicting himself. I can't remember who it is who said, um, do I contradict myself very well, then I contradict myself. Uh, <laughs> Ollie, Ollie was quite unafraid to do quite the opposite of what he'd done in a previous piece. He felt that was enough of that. And you remember when he had crazes about composers, and he did have these wonderful crazes about composers, he would go right the way through the output of everything. Oh, I found another little piano, he was fine where it was, or whatever it was. And then quite abruptly, having done a, a very thorough tour of that composer, he'd discard that and say, right, done that. I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm interested in something, yeah. And he moved on to something else. Of course, he quite often came back to these enthusiasms. And in the last months of his life, Feldman, which was a composer he'd been quite interested in in the 70s and 80s. I don't know if, I think he knew him slightly. Um, and of course, his great friend Michael Susan Thomas was very much a Feldman champion. Um, but then in the 2000s, I remember I went around a German bookshop with Ollie. And by the way, going around bookshops with Ollie is something I'll always miss because you never knew what he'd find. And I found some analytic book about Feldman. He said, Oh, I'm tired of all that. And, so, and then suddenly, what started the Feldman enthusiasm up again was the BBC Radio 3 asked the Flux Quartet to broadcast overnight the, the very long six hour second string quartet, which is precisely the sort of piece if you think, if you want to stereotype Ollie as a, a, a composer engaged with the great Western tradition, you think he'd loathe any such notion of a six hour quartet that repeats this and does, you know, sort of conceptual type thing like that. No, no, no. But Ollie wasn't like that. So he. He tuned in and he said to me the following, he said, funny thing about that piece is that wherever you tuned in, there was something interesting happening. And then he began to conduct Feldman again. So, you know, maybe that would have, I mean, there could have been later a, a, a Feldman Ollie piece, which would have been very exciting. Um, so, uh, you know, anything that was being listened to could have come out and he would have certainly surprised us and continued to very, very much. Yeah, I'm sure. great he learned the year I went to Tanglewood he just learned to drive or he learned to drive the year before and I'd go for a lesson and he said let's go for a drive and we'd like get a map out I remember once he said oh I think there's a haunted house here he'd like what you know he pointed on the map let's go and have a drive went for a drive in his Nissan Cherry god knows where we went and we just like slowed down past this house because it was haunted and then drove back I think he just wanted to drive his car <laughs> yeah I can't remember a lot about Tanglewood, to be honest. Really? So long ago. I know that I didn't write any music when I was there, I just couldn't write, I think. And Ollie was saying, don't worry about it. You know, you have a tough enough time as a young composer keeping you going, so just have a good time whilst you're here, don't worry about it. And Which was good advice, because when I went home then, I wrote a whole load of music. So that, even that was good, was good advice. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, 
it was strange for me in a way because I spent a lot of time with Ollie when, when, when he was teaching me and then didn't see as, as much of him um, over maybe the past 20 years or so, 20, 25 years, but then when he came to start working here, you know, I, I saw an awful lot of him again. And then it got very connected with, you know, with all the students and everybody coming and working. So I kind of had him, you know, early on and more recently. And I think we we're just lucky here. I think we we approached him at exactly the right time. I think he really, I, think, I know he loved coming here and he loved the contact with the students because he's I think he's feeling isolated, right. wasn't he, in uh, Snape. So I think we just got incredibly lucky and just got him here at the right time when he was less able to travel around um, conducting as well. So in a way it was a, a, bit, a bit of a lifeline for him coming here. And I think it helped him composing the last few pieces, I think. Being here definitely helped get those out. These incredible seminars with the students, again in the same room, that we could, the 40 of us could just about fit in, pack all the chairs in, and he'd say, right, I'm going to talk about Tippett or Takamitsu or something, and he would, and these were over two hours, and he would spend the first hour and a half talking about something else, or, you know, just answering questions to the students, and he'd remember he had to, I remember one, one time he was going to analyse the ASCO concerto, and it got to about half 12, it was about half hour left, and he remembered he had to analyse the ASCO concerto, I thought there's no way he can do this in half an hour. And he had a chart with all the metric modulations and the settlers and all that. And he completely, he, he analysed the whole piece in half an hour in a really clear, succinct way that was crystal clear to the students, um, which is such a skill. And I can't, I've never really figured out how he, he was so brilliant at, at dismantling these, I mean obviously it's because he was conducting the piece inside out and half the piece he talked about. He, Commission, but you just know everybody in the room and, and all the students were completely understanding and getting all the information up when he was analysing the pieces. And I think it was his. I think that the, the way in which he talked about music was, in a way, kind of very untechnical, certainly unacademic. And there was always the, all his wit in there and clarity of thought and a very clear slow way and very uh, direct way in which he explained music in a class like that which obviously comes through being a conductor and being very clear with an orchestra that was a part of the way he taught those those classes um, just sat with his with his ipod early on before he he can be bought him a laptop for all his music sitting talking about Metian and stockhausen with just such clarity and, and clear shape to the talks and just an, ent an entertaining and engaging, you could hear a pin drop on the room. Nobody else could really, really do that. All the people who all came in and analysed music for Ollie, it was just, you know, it just flew by. And um, just wonderful. It was such a wonderful. And of course, we never filmed any of them. <laughs> it's ridiculous, isn't it? So, um, so when I, looking back to when he taught me, which is, nearly 40 years ago now, when I was a 21, 22 student at the Guildhall, and I would go for a lesson in West End Lane and just show him rubbish. I mean, I tried to think what, what, what sort of terrible pieces I showed him, but he was, you know, what, what, how he taught me and what he taught me to look at and things that he explained me and explained to me and how he showed me his harmonies working, his own pieces and and all the kind of technical information he gave me and things he told me to go, go away and listen to. It's extraordinary that he could see that in, in these ridiculous little student pieces I was taking him. I don't know how he could see what I was going to be interested in, you know, years and years down the line. And that's only, that's only dawned on me over the, you know, years and years and years after. Things, you know, pennies have dropped to things that he planted. Um, so, so I don't know how somebody can do that. Just know what somebody needs before they know themselves and have a sense of where they will go or what, what they might be interested in doing. He, he kind of set me off on a path that I couldn't see for a long time, but it's absolutely what I needed 10, 20 years later. Um, and that, that's extraordinary, I think, to, 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 have the, to be so perceptive and be able to 
to see that as somebody who didn't really know that. I saw him maybe once, once a month for 18 months or so, maybe. I was always very nervous going for my lessons. I mean, it's always great, great fun and I relaxed as soon as I got there, but um, I was just trying to remember, remember everything he was saying and trying to impress him and hope just um, very naive with my expectations of what he would think of the music. And a, and a lot of it, I mean, I did remember a lot of what he said, but it, it didn't all click. A lot of it didn't click for a long time. Um, so so that's, that's extraordinary. And I hope the students here will have got some of that, I'm sure, sure they will have, will have done. Um, call the students clients. Here. <laughs> what time's my next client? <laughs> But I also, I mean, he, 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 all the different styles of swallow, you know, the, 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 he could transition between working and not, you know, the kind of big rehearsing or not rehearsing or teaching, talking about music. It was all just, very, it was all just a natural flow, wasn't it? There was never, now I'm going to stop working and have an hour off or whatever. He, he was always the same person, just in different situations. I think that's... Um, why he was so brilliant, really, in, in this kind of, you know, in, in a place like the Academy, because all the time that he was just a delight to be with, but you were constantly learning stuff from him. I, I always was, right up until the end. Um, and the, the other thing I was just thinking, um, when I used to call him to talk about, you know, when he was next coming or whatever, I'd always ring him when I was working, because just to hear his voice, to think of his voice now, gets me so excited about being a composer. And um, I think I try to think back sometimes when I'm working or you know thinking about well, I don't want to go and work and I've got to um, sit down and try and write some music to, to try and feel the excitement of, of being with him. Or when I was younger, having those lessons in West Hampstead, and and, and his voice on the phone is, was enough to get me to get me excited. You know, so I'd al always stop right in the middle of, of working and call him, um, hoping he answered the phone. And yeah, the sound of his voice, just nothing for me as a composer, makes me as excited about writing music as Ollie's voice. Yeah, yeah it kind of encapsulates everything. Now the, mu the music wants into, you know, loving that music um, as much as, as him. Yeah, that, that for me is magical, really. And I can hear his voice now, you know, absolutely very, very, uh, very easily. This, I think this ability to be able to see what people are trying to do on the page. I mean, clearly he was more interested in certain types of composers than composers who may be more interested in working with technology. But um, I think he, he oh, one thing the students would, would, would say to me, and what they would tell each other when somebody was, you know, was new and they're having their first lesson with him, they say, take a lot of music because he's so fast. And he'll, he'll go through a score really quickly and give you advice, you know, and if you need to have enough music to show him because he's really, really quick with giving you technical advice and also if, if you show a piece you're writing, he'll very quickly latch on to, you know, certain things that maybe you need to think about um, you know, work, working on. So it was the speed of, um, of feedback that I think students were, became very aware of and also going completely off track and talking about of films and God knows what else, and all sorts of other things, or, or kind of in a way related, I suppose. But yeah, super, super fast. Yeah. And just straight two things on the back. I mean, you, you know, this incredible. And then obviously the the, the amazing thing about having all here was was that. The instrumentalist got to open him and conduct him in the Manson Ensemble, which is incredible to think, you know, yeah. we had all in us and did in the student new music group. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. Amazing Soldier's Tale CD. So we we're so lucky to get him. Yeah. When I think of, you know, um, having Ollie here when he was maybe doing a Manson concert and having Harry Burt whistle and, and Max and having lunch and that, I think that's an important moment in British music, you know. Um, when everyone would be here, you know, working together, and then very quickly they, they've all died, you know, and it's gone. And it's only now you're looking back, you think how important those moments and those concerts and those conversations were. It's 
quite shocking how you know fleeting everything is. But yes, o o Ollie, um, how, how he knows what people are trying to do, but don't know that's what they're trying to do. I don't know how, 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 he, how he could do that. Really, it's incredible. I think also he liked the, the fact that, that there was the connection again, and that, and that mm -hmm. he still felt that there was a lot in common. Because I, I, I always think composers, we can there's, there can be generation gaps quite easily between you know somebody my age and somebody who's in their early twenties. And, and I think Ollie maybe thought that might be the case, but absolutely wasn't the case. So I think that that made him feel good that there was you know very much to share in both directions. To program with Ollie was one of the great joys and sometimes one of the great challenges. Uh, he had, of course, this extensive knowledge of the repertoire. So when, when I was talking to Ollie, I thought, well, you know, I knew this piece or that piece. But of course, you know, when Ollie knew something, he knew it in such a deep way um, and would have an extraordinary way of posing the juxtaposition of particular pieces. One of the great fascinations for me was seeing the way his mind worked about what might work next to another. Sometimes with conductors um, and other programmers, they would do the, what do we start with, what do we finish with? With Ollie, it was always driven by what are the pieces that have particularly excited him. Often, what are the pieces that he feels um, need some extra help? What are the pieces that maybe other people are going to ignore? Which are the composers that he has a particular fascination for at the, at the time? So there were certain things that you knew were going to be part of his repertoire, the composers that interested him, whether it be that particular Stravinsky, or that particular Altenberg, or that particular Debussy, or that particular Schoenberg. Um, but of course, uh, his extraordinary connection to so many contemporary composers as well meant that there was always that burning desire that you felt to, to get something new and unfamiliar. Even if it wasn't new from yesterday or from this year, but something to be able to offer to the public that had captured his particular imagination. One of the many extraordinary things about his programs, and if it's endlessly fascinating to look at the things that in this you know, tragically short, as we now know, life, um, the things that he didn't conduct, but also, unlike, I think, any other conductor that I can think of, he hardly ever repeated pieces. So there was a... And it wasn't just that he lost interest in them, but actually he got more interested in other things and knew that he had this um, sort of campaign, this passion, um, this zeal for presenting pieces that he felt had been ignored or were in danger of being ignored. Um, and uh, you know, to look over the decades of his concert programs and realize actually how relatively rare it was for him um, to conduct a, a piece more than once uh, is extraordinary when you think of his international career. And, and it also speaks, I think, to his his really inquiring mind and the fact that all the time he was receiving scores, all the time he was asking for scores, all the time he was asking for recordings. It was that treasure trove and completely chaotic um, collection of scores and recordings that 
one met and had to fight your way through when you went to when you went to see him he always just saw the music as being music that he would want to engage with and would want to come fresh to because he is his own musical personality but also not to be able to go you, know, you need to hear my my Beethoven 8 or you need to hear the way that Peter Serkin and I will do Brahms second piano concerto it was absolutely you know, this is something that interests me and of course you know for those of us who are the mere mortals trying to facilitate these programs um, it was a real joy to sit with somebody who you know, as soon as they said you know actually that's interesting me at the moment that's interesting me at the moment you knew that something special would would emerge one of the important things to say about ollie in programming is exactly the same as ollie in in other bits of his life which of course is that he was a control freak so you, know, you couldn't just say and actually to to any artist it's hard to imagine being able to go I've just thought of this great program. I'd like you to do this. Um, now, if one had a good enough relationship with Ollie, you could start throwing a few things that might just land, sometimes on fertile ground, sometimes on stony ground. But you knew that he would have to be the person that was in control of it. And you know, I was entirely, of course, comfortable with that because... His ideas were always better than mine and also that he was the person who was going to be delivering it and you might think you'd had a really good order for those four or five pieces in the program and he'd just go let me just have a let me have a think about that for a few days um, and he'd come back with a much better order yeah. and it would make much more much more sense of it um, so so that sense of um, him needing to have the final say was really important to him particularly, but also because he was that extraordinary sort of creative figure that he was. Sometimes with, with Ollie, there was um, a bit of gameplay that mm. went on, um, because apart from anything else, it was, it was fun. Um, and sometimes I would throw something at him, which I knew was not going to land at all well, but it would lead him to a different place. Um, and he, of course, would know that's exactly what I was doing. Um, sometimes you know, there would be something that he would instinctively feel wasn't quite right for him, mm -hmm. but he would um, give one the respect to, to think about it. Um, so I remember in what turned out sadly to be his final Olga festival just before he died when he conducted um, complete Appalachian Spring and um, and I said you know would you just do Appalachian Spring because the, you know, the rest of the program was a very Ollie program um, and you know, we had a big hall to fill um, and one of Ollie's a, many specialities was not filling a hall, mm -hmm. and one of the other specialities was not worrying about not filling a hall, but rather sweetly. And I, it, 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 it makes me feel enormously sad um, to, to tell this particular story. But um, I asked him to think about Appalachian Spring uh, and, 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 and doing it, um, which he said, well, I don't really know, but I knew that he was thinking about it because, of course, he had such a close connection to Copeland as yes. well. But there was an element in which he was thinking, could I, should I be doing something more contemporary in that? Should I be doing something more unusual? Part of that was always mm -hmm. in his mind. Um, but in that program were also other very distinctive pieces. Um, and finally, um, I think memory serves me right we of course had already gone to press that was mm -hmm. one of his other specialities <laughs> of then but then waiting until the point at which you'd announce something else and then decided that he would change it a bit like the the moments at which he turned around and say i'm going we're going to play that piece again mm, yes. um one of his other specialities within 
um, uh, presenting a programme that you thought you'd agreed, uh, the opportunity to hear something twice. Um, but he said, no, he would do Appalachian Spring. And then sometime afterwards, I, I was able just to go and tell him, I said, you know that concert you know, you're doing the BBC Symphony Orchestra? He said, yes. I said, you know, it's sold out. And, and part of me was thinking he would be a bit cross with himself for having agreed. Um, but actually, he just looked and smiled and said, you know, uh, I'm really quite chuffed, which is a very Ollie word yeah. for, actually, I'm quietly rather pleased mm. with that. So to know that there was that really softer side of him that was, I mean, apart from anything else, pleased that the rest of the program was also going to get that sort of yes. attention was really important. You're always struck in those conversations um, by his uh, respect for the music and also his extraordinary knowledge of the performance and recorded history of the music. Mm. So he was he was already um, so aware of the responsibility on the one hand as a composer trying to do the right thing by the music and the ex extraordinary legacy uh, which he was part of um, that yeah, he, he could easily in a way freeze couldn't he um, in, in, and, and, he, and he, of course he froze compositionally mm. as well as every now and then Freezing about, you know, how can he bring something something new to it? Even mm. though he he surely somewhere deep down had enough confidence to know that and interest in bringing something really special to it. But it's um, but it's one of those great paradoxes that that often the greatest people are the most fragile. Out of the blue one summer, it's Gil Kalish calling. Oh, hey. I'm a Tanglewood. Yeah, that's right. I know you work at Tanglewood. Those, do you know who Oliver Nussen is? I said, this is um, where the Wild Things. This was 1988. So Wild Things was still a new thing. I said, yes, yes, I've heard of him. I had never met him. He goes, well, he runs the Festival of Contemporary Music here. He feels he needs an assistant. I said, I don't know if you'd be interested in that. I felt like jumping through the phone and saying, interested? This is a lifesaver. My God. I said, yes, absolutely. He goes, well, I recommended you to him. I was like, oh my God, that would be fantastic. He goes, well, look, why don't you take a drive up to Tanglewood and have lunch with Ollie? Just meet him, just see how you hit it off. Drove up, met him in where he would always meet people in the cafeteria of Tanglewood. And I mean, we hit it off immediately, you know? We, we bonded talking about the late works of Stravinsky. <laughs> so the following summer, I was there as, as it was his assistant, but I was also one of the conductors for the Festival of Contemporary Music. And then another thing, which was very meaningful to me, was so that summer when I started working with him, he had scheduled the Stravinsky Orchestra Variations, Altus Huxley. That was with the orchestra. Wow, amazing. We get to the dress rehearsal, you know, and I'm sitting out there. I was doing at the dress rehearsal, and um, I don't remember if he played through the Stravinsky, because, you know, it's only four and a half minutes. Or if without playing through, he just turns around to me in the audience and he, he doesn't really, you know, just beckons to me. I come up to him and he goes, how would you like to conduct the run through? I mean, I almost fainted, you know, because this to me was like such an amazing piece. I said, yes. So he let me do the run through and he says, how would you like to do it again? <laughs> he let me run the piece twice. Okay, it's only four and a half minutes, but so, and I'll say one more thing actually, which is salient feature of, 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 of his, which was that in the same way that he could tell the orchestra in only a few words the most important things that they were able to now just go, ah, we know, 
he would do the same thing with you as a, as a as a composer or a conductor. Maybe he would even do it as a person. I don't I don't know. But with me as a composer and as a conductor, it, you know, so, so the so the whole summer has gone by. I was one summer I was there as a composer. I showed him one score that I had written, and he said, "Can I borrow this?" He took the score. He took the tape. I didn't hear from him for a couple of weeks. I thought to myself, ah, whatever, whatever, forget it. And one day he shows up uh, with composers lived, and I, they were, you know, I was thinking too, and here's my score, my tape. He goes, here, I finally listened to it. He goes, you want to come for a walk? Mm, okay. How would you like to come next summer as a composer in the fellowship? I couldn't, I, because I knew people that had applied seven years in a row and stuff like this, you know. So, like, yes. Yeah. So anyway, uh, the next summer, now this was 1990, I was there as a composer. And <laughs> it was hard to pin Ollie down for a lesson, you know. How about a lesson? Well, how, okay, well, how about that? How about, and I just thought, look, I don't want to, I'm not going to bother him. I'll have a lesson when the time is right. The whole summer goes by, and we're now after the final, the orchestra concert. I don't know if it was the one that he conducted or one of the ones that, you know, one of the fellows. It doesn't matter. And there was always this party, orchestra party at Miss Hall's school. And I said, um, I said, hey, you know, we, we never really found the time to have a lesson or even just chat. But he goes, yes, oh, of course, I, I have a lot of things. Let's, let's, go for, let's go for a walk. And we're walking, walking. And he proceeds to say the few salient things about my, my compositions in general that were, you know, so right on the money. And so, you know, and I said, how did he do that? How did he just... It's the same thing with, with conducting, too. You know, I think this is the first summer. He goes, you tend to detail a lot. He goes, why well, I let them play through things? And I said, well, yes, of course. I mean, detail, you have to... Detail, you want to get a certain level of polish in front. He goes, yes, but if you let them play through, I'll never forget this, you know what, they know what's coming around the corner. And at the time, I was like, what, is it? what does he mean? When I think of his approach to not just conducting, but conducting, rehearsing, getting across to the musicians what they need to do to realize the composer's intentions and to realize the, 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 the highest you know, integrity or musical, musical result. Um, and the thing that was so fantastic about Ollie, and which for, at first me watching him was a mystery, is he, di he didn't seem to do, it's not that he didn't do much, he just did the right amount of everything. So I remember watching some rehearsals of, of Ollie's, and I said, oh, wow, he's got so good. It's clear, it's clean. Uh, and of course, when he would just barely do a bigger upbeat, he would get an explosion of sound simply because he's a little bit, he was a little bit taller than, than I am. But just his manner of working and everything. But here was the mystery. He would start something, it would be the first rehearsal, and they would play through, I don't know, maybe two minutes of music? And he would stop. And he would say something that at the time, to me, seemed so general. You know, he'd say, now the thing with this piece is, and he'd say something, all the sforzandos should be, and all the accents, or all the short notes, so let's go back to the beginning. And it'd be a million times better. I said, I don't understand, how, how is he doing that, you know? But when you, you find those two or three general things to say that just completely elevates everything. The other thing was sitting with him going through all the pieces that were to be conducted for any given summer. But we would sit and go through all these scores and he had this ability to sort of quickly look through, okay, this piece is gonna to come together easily, except look at this section over here. You, to tell them they're gonna to have to give you a, a horn player who has an amazing high register, we're going to need, well, the viola part's really challenging, and, but then the rest of it should come together really easily. I was like, how did he, chomp, 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 like this. And I remember him saying to me, here, look through these scores and try and, you know, look for those kinds of things. I said, what do you mean? Well, like, da, 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 da. this is going to be easy, but okay, boom. This is really tricky. It's, you know, too many balance problems. You're going to need extra time because of this and such. This, it's fine, except when, oh, wow, yeah, we're going to need a really virtuosic oboe player, you know. The other thing, and maybe I think this, I perhaps, I value this probably above everything else about him, was that he was, he was just himself. He was himself.
He was no, without fanfare, without calling attention, without you know, um, he did the most magnificent uh, everything for everybody. I mean, and that and this I I have such this is so important to me when somebody is you know the focus what they do the devotion you know the focus the devotion the, the this, I mean it to such a degree without going hey you know look at me or look at what I did or my recording is better than that other one you know or whatever um, he he just he was very very unique in that in that way and then that concert with the Helsinki Philharmonic uh, the, the, radio has, orchestra. the radio orchestra oh there was the radio orchestra it wasn't the Helsinki okay so the radio orchestra the Finnish radio and he's doing Brahms too and I I, I, I said wow this is online you can see this I said I have to see this because I because I know I predicted what it was, it was going to be it was a fantastic performance because it had this kind of and again I say you know old school which these days there's too many you, we don't know what decade one means by that great sense of of style, a great sense of line, a great sense of of you know of variety, and maybe the most important thing is without lavishing on some sort of varnish that has nothing to do with the composer, without a sort of self-serving kind of a thing. And of course, that's that's what it sounded like. I said, my God, this is this to me is what Brahms should sound like and it reminds me of older performances of generations gone by that you don't hear that much. I was 16 years of age and Ollie was like this big figure because I knew, you know, I'd seen his picture in the Proms Prospectus in 1976. I started studying with him in 77, January 77. And this idea that this sort of amazing musician would have any time for me because I, I wasn't very confident. And the amazing thing is that he instilled in me this great belief, uh, which I didn't have. I had no confidence. And this is the quality that everyone knows about Ollie. Is that it, 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 it's this kindness that I've never encountered with anybody before or since. Um, he really cared and he saw something in me, I don't know, I, I still don't quite know what it was, but what he did see is, is that he could really help me confidence wise, but also, you know, he used to say to me, um, when I, sometimes I broke down in lessons and sometimes I, I got over emotional probably and get worried about, you know, just to sort of, you know, teenage angst. And he'd say, you are a composer, you can compose. And I thought, well, maybe I can, because this man who I revere is telling me that I can do it. So it just gave me huge boost. One, another little story, actually, um, when I was, uh, I was not very academic at school. In fact, I was pretty poor. Uh, I couldn't get what we call O-levels in England for, for to, you know, I, um, very few of those, which I also think Ollie, Thought was great because um, that was like him. We both of us didn't have any qualifications. We've only got honorary qualifications. <laughs> but he, he, because of this, I had to get a grant from my local authority, my local council, Essex County Council. And I asked Ollie, I said, could you give me a reference? And he said, yeah. And, he, and in my lesson, he started writing this out in his immaculate handwriting. And he basically uh, sealed, no, no, he got gave me the envelope, he didn't seal the envelope. Obviously anticipating that I would look at it. And it was amazing because what he said about me was so lovely, was so incredible that, that, that he, but he knew this would give me a boost. He knew that that would be something that would really help me. And you know, he, he, I'd phone him up. I mean, the, the phone booth thing, because my parents didn't have a, a phone at the time, so I had to go out to a, a local uh, phone booth. And I'd always reverse the charges because I couldn't afford it. And he'd always phone me back for at least an hour, sometimes, you know, quite often, in fact, almost always, four or five times a week. Now, to, to do that, I mean, I was obviously Denny's friend, but I mean, we were actually only eight, 
years apart you know, in terms of born. So, so in a way, he's, he's my generation, if you think about it, even though he was my teacher, because he was pretty young, he was 24 when he started teaching me. But he just, you know, and I, I wouldn't just talk about music, it would be about everything, it was about literature, I remember he, he had to think about Rabelais, you know, the French philosopher, he had to think about um, loads of things that were like, you know, quite obscure. But he introduced me to painting, he introduced me to, to, to I mean, music, he used to give me these little cassettes, he'd, he, he, in the old days of cassettes, and he'd do me like mixed tapes, he'd, he'd write out, uh, he'd spend ages recording, you know, like these things off his, off his uh, records, I suppose, and then, and then just give me like, you know, just things that I should listen to. So, you know, he's enormous knowledge that everybody knows about. He, he, he was so excited to watch my reaction, I remember, once um, in Crystal Palace, because he lived uh, at Alan Hacker, you know, the clarinetist's mm -hmm. old house in Crystal Palace. Um, and I remember he loved, he loved to look at my reaction and he played me Messiaen's Tarangalila Symphony. And I just couldn't believe this. And we just, I listened to the whole of it. He played it, just played it to me. And he said, it's amazing, you know, he had all these sort of joking things about, you know, sort of um, so decadent and, you know, as we know about it. But, but this, this, this was incredible. The other thing I remember, which is sort of a thing that he instilled in me, and I'm talking about him as a teacher, and I know I shouldn't sort of go on that territory, but it really was, um, felt like as a friend, is that, that I, at times, you know, when I wanted this, when I was really not confident, I said, I can't do this, Ollie. When this is when he said, you know, you are a composer, you can do this. And he, I said, well, look, you did all this, you know, you wrote Ophelia Dances when you were young, you wrote a first symphony when you were 15, and, um, you know, I, I, you know I, I'm just saying, you know, I, 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 you know, and he said, I'll show you some of the things I was writing when I was 14, and actually when he was 16. And he said they were shit. He said there were some really bad pieces in it. And he showed me, he got, the, I remember in his house, he got these pieces out. And he said, and they weren't that good, but they, they were not bad, but yeah. they were, and he goes, see, people don't develop in a straight line. But that, that, that's, what, that, that's what he did. That's what he did as a teacher. But... Also, you know, I've got numerous emails where he's asking me. I mean, he, he was very invested in what was happening with, with me sort of personally. I remember, like, um, once I, I got very drunk in the centre of London with friends from my local, from Essex. Um, and basically, I got lost and they, they went off. Um, and I ended up at Ollie's and I was pretty drunk. And I remember he sort of walking me to sober me up and walked mm -hmm. around, the, you know, around the block. And he sort of didn't ever, ever sort of tell me off, but he goes, those friends, you know, they're not great. I, you know, I actually was, I took his advice and they sort of, I distanced myself. But you know, th that's the thing is he, 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 he was incredibly wise um, about things. And I've got emails where he's, he's really sort of saying, you know, I think you should be doing, you know, but not in a, not in a, in such a lovely way, but he says, I think, you know, I'm worried about you, you know, and, the sad thing is he never really applied that for himself, you know, yeah. and, and this is the thing, he was so incredibly sh um, clear-sighted about other people's problems, which made him an, an incredible friend, yeah. because he would say, you know, all these things and, and solve things, like he did, he solved things in a way like he did solve problems with composition, you know, I'd take him things and he'd go, I think if you move this section here, or if you do this, or if you do that, um, I think the piece will work. And, and, you know, they always did when I tried these things out. But he also did that privately as well, as, a, as, a, as you know, as a, as a, in a human way, you know, in, in, a, in a way that it was personal. He'd, he'd say, I, you know, this, you know, I don't know, it's just amazing to think. And, and this is why for me, uh, he's a great loss, of, obviously, to the musical world, but personally, it's somebody that, um, that I think about every day. Uh, I, I don't go through a day without thinking about him. And I can't think about anybody else like that, even though I've had some people I've been close to who are not here anymore, but not like Ollie, because he, he just, he was like my dad, because, you know, he just cared, but also he, he really wanted me, you know, it was amazing what he did for me. I mean, you know, just this confidence building, he really saw something in me, but at the same time, and also, I also remember when I first met him, uh, it was my first lesson at the Royal College of Music Junior Department, so it was in Kensington, South Kensington, mm -hmm. opposite the Albert Hall. I remember uh, he, his, where his teacher was on the top floor of the, of the um, 
of, of, of the Royal College of Music. And I remember going up and I was his last lesson of the day. It was like a one o'clock or something. And I remember like arriving and then he opened the door and I go, you're Mr. Nusson. And he goes, how do you know that? I said, because I've seen your picture and your picture was in the proms prospectus in 1976 where he worked with uh, uh, Mike Swabavis in the Fires of London. And from that moment, I looked him in the eye. That was it. That was from that very moment. I, it's amazing to think about him, you know, the way that we just got on. It's, you know, some people you just get on with, and he's one of those people. And, and I have the same with his sister, Susan. Um, yeah. I don't know her very well. I've met her a few times, but I met her, you know, at the memorial. I have exactly the same thing. This connection. I don't know what it is. It's just one. Some people you just have it with. Right. And I had, you know, and I thought that's a family thing in a, in a very interesting way. And I, and I just looked at him. I thought, yeah, I like, and it is like. Yeah, we like each other. I, you know, all these, I could tell he liked me. I liked him. I mean, we, it was a lot of humour. I mean, I just remember doing things even right in a string quartet. And I said, oh, this string quartet's about squalor. And he just was so fascinated by this <laughs> quartet. So, so we, f throughout our life, he said, oh, have you written any squ pieces about squalor lately? <laughs> I mean, you know, the humour was extraordinary. Yeah. But it, th that was a running joke with us yeah. um, for, throughout, you know, uh, well, I knew him from yeah for four, over forty years. To think about it, also though, is that he was he gave so much. So that when, yeah. it, when he was let down, and it happened a few times to yeah. some people, he really was hurt, yeah. and and I, and I I completely understand that. And so I think that that because he gave so much, yeah. he he would always, you know, really worry about people. It would it, and it would be amazing what he the support he gave. Yeah. Um, but you know, sometimes he didn't always get it back. He did from his really close friends. Yeah. When, no, so that's so I don't want to be negative, but it, it is interesting. There's a few. Yeah. I think that I think you know I'm talking about, but but because I think he just invested so much in in people. I mean, yeah. really, really, you know, the, all these composers that he, he he loved, like George, Magnus, you know, as well. They're, they're, you know, and Colin. They're all they're, you know they're all very special people. Exactly. To him. But, I, but when I stayed with him, I, and especially in the last sort of, 10 years, I'd quite often stay with him for four or five days, uh, well, sometimes two or three days, but I'd stay with him and sit at the kitchen mm. table and um, certain people would phone. And I yeah. always could tell if it was George, mm -hmm. it was quite amusing because it'd be a very amusing sort of, he'd, the, the opening line would be, you know, I thought, oh, that's George. Yeah. And so then I and then he'd want me to talk to George. Yeah. Um, but we sat there, and, and that was um, amazing because we'd, we'd watch, it, on his little laptop, we'd watch videos. Uh, um, he'd just say, what should we look at? You know, what, what are we going to look at? And, and, and sometimes it would be, um, quite often, because I knew less about, I suppose, con conductors. He was quite, quite fascinated watching, like, Fritz Reiner or yeah. all these people. And then he'd go, and then he'd suddenly freeze it and go, look at, look at. Look at that! Look at that stare! It's a death stare! Look at him! <laughs> He's obviously really unhappy with the oboes or, yeah. or something. I mean, it was amazing. He, would, he yeah. would, so we'd sit there, and all this knowledge I was getting, you know, from and he'd play me scores, and sometimes he'd play me things blind, saying, "Do you know? This yeah. is, guess what that this is?" Um, and also, then we'd often go and watch complete crap TV. Yeah. I mean, the amount of times we, you know, we had this thing where he, there's various there's programs in in England where you can, if you get it so where you can watch two hours of this absolutely like you know. The, game shows basically mm. but it was it was there was such a warmth and i always felt you know that it cocooned really in this yeah. house i love that house and i yeah. love being there and it, it's it's yeah it's very strong memory the last time i saw him actually when i sat not the last time i saw him but the last time i was went to visit him mm. which is probably maybe four or five months before he died um I remember sitting, he sat at the table, and I sat at a certain place in the table, right on the side, and, I, and for hours and hours we sit there. And I, and I remember just looking at him thinking, I've got to take this in, I've got to really just drink this in because it's not going to be lasting forever. And I, 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 it's not like I took it for granted, but I just thought, this is, he's very special and I've got to make the most of this. And, and, and towards the end, he talked a lot about his dad. Um, he talked a lot about family things, which he, he, I mean, it's not like he was closed on that, but he talked more and more. Um, unfortunately, he talked about living, you know, beyond his dad. And that, that, that was a bit of a recession. He always felt he wasn't going to live as long, he was only going to live as long as his dad did, which was 66, which he did. And he survived his dad by one day. And I thought that was very sad. But 
but he had this, you know, his dad was a very um, major figure in his life. But, you know, also uh, past composers, we, I, I've got this amazing email about Richard Ronnie Bennett, uh, because we, he, he really loved Richard. Um, and it was really like almost like what he's, he was really giving me advice of how to cope with Richard's death because, you know, I, I was very, you know, I was very close to Richard. And it's really like a manual for coping with his. Yeah. It's amazing. It's about how you, you know, all this richness that, you know, he's gone, but you've got all this music. And, and I remember like fairly soon, well, after Richard died, we had like a weekend of just listening to Richard's music and watching film because Richard wrote a lot of yeah. film scores. And, he goes, well, you, know, you don't know this film. It's like really obscure. Nobody knows about it. And he said, and this amazing um, film music that he wrote for it. And then it, we watch it. And he had these sort of celebrations. And that's, that's another thing. Also, the obsessions with certain things. I mean, the obsessions with, you know, you go and one, one time it would be, um, it could be Richard Strauss, and then it'd be El Gar. You know, it'd be, it would change. You know, yeah. and it'd be Sati and... Um, you know, it would, it would, he'd have little fads for like weeks and yeah. find everything he could and like order all the scores and that he hadn't got, which is he pretty much had everything. But that was that was amazing as well. But he wanted to share that. He got, he, you know, exactly. uh, he, it was it was. Um, maybe I shouldn't mention this, but before I was meant to go and see him that w- the next week after uh, um, the, the weekend week after he died, mm. I was about to go around uh, go and stay with him. And he, he says, um, and I suppose you can't really use this on film, but, uh, but he said, do you know the music of Robert Simpson? And um, he said, he said, do you know anything? And I said, no. And he said, it's crap. He said, but it's interesting crap. He said, there's a symphony, there's a scherzo, and he just goes on forever. And it's really bad, but it's really interesting bad. <laughs> I love those sort of observations. Yeah. He'd make observations about music and he'd say, you know, I remember, I think it was Schrecker or one of those sort of like, you know, lesser known sort of German composer. He goes, what do you think's wrong with this? There's something not quite right. And he said, I think I've worked it out. But see if, and I, I couldn't work it out. He said, it's, it's got no ba- the bass lines are terrible. There's no bass, there's nothing, you know, um, underpinning. Right. He said, really, really great composers. That's, you know, that's a very special thing. And, and he, you know, that's what he could do. He could pinpoint things that were a problem or with composers um, that were, you know that that were that were like you know other people might not observe, but he, yeah. he got he worked it out. The thing is, I always used to say to him, uh, "Can you rip me apart, Ollie?" And he'd go, "Well, I'm not going to do that." Cause, and this is what's so amazing about his teaching, is that he would do it in such a great way that was like you know he was sort of saying this doesn't work, yeah. and you know you should do this and move things around. But what what he, he did it in such again a kind way and a positive way. That's the thing about him yeah. as a teacher. He was so positive, even when he was trying to tell you something that didn't work. It would never be, you know, and he'd, he'd have like the phrases like, you can fix this. So the two phrases I had when I was a kid, um, particularly, was you can fix it, and also get on with it. Don't think, don't worry about other people. I used to come to him with a lot of things like, oh, my career is not, and, you know, I was comparing myself, especially ridiculous, because a lot of young composers, mm-hmm. people like George, and people, you know, you know, you feel sort of like, you, you sort of, um, you tend to sort of judge yourself against, you know, especially if they're doing, and Ollie would go, don't worry about it. Everybody develops in a different way. You know, just, just, just get on with it. He wasn't great at his own, but his advice to, you know, to me was that, you know, just, just, just get on with it and, 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 and fix it was the other one, which I always found sort of amazing, really, because he really could. Yeah. I mean, he, he just had this amazing advice. And yeah. one of the proudest moments in my life it was he, he blind tested me the Canzonetta by Stravinsky and Sibelius, and I never heard it. I may have been aware of it, but I've certainly never heard it. And I, I wasn't, I just really didn't know it. And he goes, You won't get this, Mark. Um, because it's like really, you know, and I got it. Well, I, I didn't get the name of it, obviously, but I said, I think it's Stravinsky, but it's not by him, it's by somebody else. And he goes, That is, he was phoning people up saying, I can't believe this. This is the first time anybody <laughs> he knew. But it was weird, it was so funny. And, and, but that's again how lovely that is. Yeah. And when he, he, that, if I was in rehearsal with him as well and I'd spot something, he goes, Great, you spotted that. You know, yeah. Again, from somebody with the best ears probably ever, of yeah. anybody ever, you know, that he gave me a compliment. But he, 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 he could do that. He could make me yeah. feel so good. Um, but in a lovely way, it wasn't, you know, it was, it was just genuine. Exactly. Was a completely yeah. genuine yeah. person. Yeah. That's the thing. The kindness was completely, you know, it was just from his heart.